I had this impression of only it's okay. That's the real. Okay, so it's a great pleasure to have uh, Professor Lincoln uh, D. Carr here. He received his BA from the University, uh, University of California, Berkeley, and his MS and PhD from uh, U Washington, Seattle. He is a IEEE uh, senior member and fellow of APS, Kabri Fellow and Jefferson Science Fellow of the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, and uh, Humboldt Fellow, uh, NSF, Distinguished International Fellow, an Embassy Science Fellow of the US Department, and an Embassy Science Fellow of the US Department of State, in which some of that capacity is held. Uh, he's an Honors Faculty Fellow and Payne Institute for Public Policy Fellow at Colorado School of Mines, where he's a professor in the quantum engineering program in the physics department, uh, and a graduate faculty advisor in the applied maths and stats department. His research brings together complexity theory, quantum information science, engineering, education, uh, condensed matter, uh, AMO, uh, physics, nonlinear dynamics, computational physics, and applied mathematics, basically everything you can think of, uh, <laughs> pushing the frontiers of complexity theory in the quantum world. Uh, to date, he has mentored over 120 students in research. He has taught uh, for over 30 years in science and engineering, social sciences, and the humanities on topics ranging from quantum physics and engineering to revolution and science, literature, and society to science and engineering. Let me see. So, uh, thank you. Uh, it's a delight to be here in Honolulu. I'm very, very impressed with this place, and it's my best to say I'm the agenda. Delighted to present to you today a talk on the emissions of physical complexity in quantum systems. I hope this will give you some new tools and ideas to think about. The intention of this talk is that it should be entirely accessible to a wide range of uh, physics and STEM audience. And then we'll get into some perhaps more specialized calculation toward the end. Uh, so it's intended to be a pedagogical talk. Uh, unfortunately, it's a little washed out, so I'm, I'm not sure if you can really see. Uh, on the background that I had a structural brain network here and a functional brain network here. And the reason I have this is that I'm, I'm using uh, mutual information as the main measure that I carry to the top. I want to let you know that I have drew this measure. Complexity, I simply applying it to quantum systems. Now, this is work that I've done over uh, many years. Uh, with many people around the world, and so here's, you know, a partial list. Uh, I just heard that one of my colleagues is a fact undergraduate uh, student together with uh, your colleagues here, and that's really exciting. I really have uh, fantastic people that I've worked with on this. It's not sort of impossible to go through all the credits that they've done, but I will mention um, the Google Quantum AI team. So part of this uh, project will involve early access use of Google's quantum computer. Um, there were seven people who had access to their original sycamore chip. So I heard this one of them, and I'll show you what uh, real calculations of a real living quantum computer uh, look like, uh, which is uh, they're, they're pretty messy actually. Okay. So now this talk is on complex networks, and complex networks <laughs> excuse me, occur between the usual quantum physics regimes. So. You all are likely used to um, order systems like lattices and hard and center physics or quantum information theory. This is a completely connected system. The idea is that these points are nodes or qubits and the links between them with some kind of connection. Okay. And then there are random systems, right? Where connections are random. That's very common in nuclear theory, of course, also chaos. But uh, there are many things between these extremes. 
You can then think of this extreme as zero entropy and where the where the least there's only one bit per minute, right? And this is maximal entropy. So here are things that are between zero and maximal entropy. And that's where complexity lies in this intermediate machine. Here's a dense network, clustered network, and a disparate network. Now I'd like to give you a, a biological sense of what these things mean. I think that would be interesting. I'll just wait off for drinking a lot of water here and you need beautiful flowering trees. Which I'm experiencing and enjoying, but there are some of these rapidly speaking. Okay, and so, uh, you know, if you think about um, a dense food web, I'm not sure if you can read it, uh, the, the slide out of focus here, but um, you see how um, these nodes, there's connections between many different nodes. This is a dense network. It's a system in which almost every organism meets every, almost every other organism. Okay, so that's an example of a dense food web. Of course, it's not completely given everything with everything, but it'll be highly connected. Here's a disparate metabolic network drawn from um, the metabolism of the cancer, actually. And uh, this has a strong backbone in, in the problem. And we're going to be looking for rearrangements of this backbone or disparity fluctuations. And then finally, here's an example of a social network that's clustered. That's another biological system class, social relationships. And uh, these communities have been identified through the clustering measure. This is you know, sort of what a clustered network would look like before human identification, but you can use it to determine your friends are and you know where key people are that kind of thing okay so those sorts of ideas are so common um, all over uh, biology social systems uh, economics uh, all kinds of physical systems where do they appear in quantum systems right well the first place they appear as a, as a practical matter is very near-term quantum devices for example in a digital quantum computer uh, you can consider long-range entangling gates and that can be a key factor in the quantum volume and we'll talk about this quantum volume some more in this talk again on the concept. Of course, network quantum systems, the idea is that uh, just like the network is itself a complex network, but it's a smaller network, um, if we're distributing entanglement on the classical network backbone, then automatically, right, our quantum network would also be a complex network. Okay, now in present quantum devices, in fact, you do find a good degree of complexity in terms of the connectivity. And so, uh, one example is, of course, idiotic quantum computers like T-Wave. So if you look at the maps that they have for the connectivity between the qubits, the original chimera map, and Pegasus, and the Zephyr map, they all have degree six or higher. Okay, so they're they're not just simple nearest neighbor type problems like you would see in a typical connect matter system. In fact, I think the Zephyr map is pretty high degree, maybe 20 plus, depending on how you look at it. So okay, uh, now analog uh, quantum computers or quantum simulators, you, you can make these kind of systems with at least seven different platforms. Okay? A partial list of some of the many, many, many people working on this thing. I myself have a paper in 2023 where I deal with continuous variable quantum mechanics. And this is the idea that you know you have an optical table and then you have optical elements that entangle uh, different colors of light. Right? So it's different colors of light from the nodes, and the entangled relationship between is produced by these nonlinear optical elements. The whole thing is that you know room temperature, you know, does not involve uh, all of the tech that you're used to seeing in the quantum systems, but it makes a very nice quantum complex network. Uh, that's work that I did with uh, here. She was on Tina Kurishi in Paris. Now, in digital quantum computers, um, there are many technologies for creating long range links. Uh, Monica Schleier Smith at Stanford uh, demonstrated in the last year or two the kind of programmable free bird gates that allow you to do these long distance gates with arbitrary structure, for example, and many other such examples. And then finally, complex networks present a new tool for theory, that is to say, for the analysis of quantum systems. And uh, I'm going to talk. In this in this presentation about quantum mutual information, like I mentioned, it's the quantum generalization of what we want to do to the brain. It's very typical measure for complexity. Now it's possible to use these kinds of measures directly on the density matrix itself. That is an open problem in progress, and here are some references, including my own most recent work um, on that problem. The reason it's typical is because the links are complex, right? So all those links so far in, in, in complex network theory, they're real value. So having complex value link is natural. Quantum mechanics, let's say, into the ground tree or any kind of wave in the moment, right? But that problem hasn't been thoroughly solved with the finger knob until like just now, just being solved. So we need now to use the density matrix. So instead, this talk is going to focus on the quantum mutual information, which is real value. Okay, now where do quantum networks appear in quantum simulators? Well, first of all, um, the whole Hamiltonian could be complex. So, like I mentioned, uh, you know, putting distributed entanglement on the backbone of the internet, right? So that's sort of, you know, you've already got the entanglement baked in. Um, you could, for example, think about what a quantum random walk would look like on a complex network. This turns out to be an advantageous method 
uh, or understanding of protein folding, which is very interesting. There's some papers on that. And then you can code the complex method directly into these links. So now you can also um, put a complex network in part of the Hamiltonian. For example, you might put in a single particle term in the Laplacian, so you'd have a, a kind of non local version of the Laplacian that had lots of links in it that would be in single particle, or you could have it be in the interactions, right? Um, you know, open quantum systems, your complex network to go into the environment. Harrison authors have done absolutely outstanding work in the series of being Chicago and there's this uh, Now, it's also possible that the network is not only in the Hamiltonian, but arises in the state. So I remind you that you know, H psi equals E psi. And for all of this, it's in the room. When you do perturbation here, you have to expand the Hamiltonian H, right? And you have to expand the state psi, and you have to expand the energy to expansions and all these things, right? So, you know, it's not only the Hamiltonian, but it's also the state of the Hamiltonian. So in this case, um, it's possible that you can lay down a very simple system, which gives rise to a complex network in the state of itself. Okay, now I'm going to show that this occurs for quantum critical points, quantum based positions. I'm going to give you a pedagogical example of this that I have to be clear for everybody in the room. For those of you who like a more advanced discussion, it's ask me to read. And then I will talk about quantum cellular time, which may be unfamiliar to people, so I've appeared some elementary description of that. How many people have seen cellular time before? Besides me, I'm actually like four people in the room. Okay, I'm really happy then that I have this introduction, and I hope that that will be useful for everyone. Okay, so again, we're going to focus on complex networks that arise spontaneously in the state. It makes a the difference uh, with these kinds of systems compared to uh, writing in the Hamiltonian. If I went in this room and I saw each of you who you had to be friends with, right, I could design a social network. Yeah, and now she has to be friends with me, like right? we friends, she would be friends with her husband, right? Uh, you know, I'm pretty sure, um, you know, uh, Gordon and I are becoming friends, you know, so, right, you know, all of those friends with people, they, 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 they arise spontaneously through local interactions. If they arise spontaneously through local interactions, that's like the state arising, that's the emergence. So if you want to see emergence, it's not going to be in the Hamiltonian, right? It's going to be in the state itself. Okay, so we're going to focus on that. All right, so this is about a complex network from quantum states. It's not operators, it's not quantum networks for quantum internet, it's really something else. Okay. So I remind you that the way that you can solve these problems to get mutual information you need a density matrix to get a matrix. That's the idea. So we're going to start with the density matrix. So this is an outer product of two quantum states. I'm going to some folks are familiar with cat notation, please stop me. Um, and so now I can take a partial trace over. You know, all of the components except for one to clarify this row is a 2 to the n by 2 to the n matrix for any of this. This row j is 2 by 2 matrix, very small. Okay. And uh, I may lose some information depending on whether this thing is sitting on a product state with the other pieces, then you get a mixed state. Now, this describes the quantum state of subsystem j. I then need to calculate the quantum entropy, the volumen quantum entry, and that is calculated as s of j equals minus trace of row j log row j. So, for those of you that have seen the Gibbs entropy, normally you have sum over P log P. Here it's trace over log row. You can see the sum has been replaced with trace, and the probability vector has been replaced with actually um, a matrix. So in some sense, quantum entropy is, is understanding you know, a higher dimensional probability of object in the matrix instead of the vector. So this quantifies entanglement. It's, it's not inhabited. Um, from this, you can derive the quantum mutual information, and we'll use that as the adjacency matrix, which is the fundamental object of the complex network theory, is the graph of the network. So we define it as follows. The mutual information is defined as the entropy of I only measure site J plus the entropy of I only measure site K minus the joint measurement of only J and K, and what remains is the relationship between J and K. I remove all relationships with the system. That's the idea. So now this quantum mutual information does have classical pieces in it, but there's an extra quantum piece in it. That's the idea. Okay, so this is a, a two-point quantum measure. So it's not local. Very important, it's bounded from below by all two-point correlators. For those of you that have condensed matter physicists or work on phase positions, and two-point correlators will be used to quantify phase positions by quantum so this is a very important feature. And so um, you know, as we go along, I'll try to make that appear with some plots, but that actually works like. Okay, so again, we're going to work with a quantum mutual information complex network. It's the generalization of the kinds of mutual information based networks used on the brain neuroscience. I also have neuroscience projects that exactly what we do in actual brains. Uh, MJK is an undirected, what we call a weighted adjacency matrix, meaning that these values are symmetric, it's a symmetric matrix. They range from 0 to 1, they're not just 0 or 1. 
uh, and then there are no self loops, so the diagonal is zero. Okay, so let's put some math in to go with those three pictures that we did before. <laughs> we talked about the density of connections, uh, the food web, how everything can eat everything. So that is just, you know, a sum over one of these indices, right? And then you can average over the system. So it's a kind of density. Um, sometimes that's called the strength distribution. The clustering coefficient, um, you know, if you want to get the average value, it's just the trace of this matrix cubed. Um, you can properly normalize it. Um, to understand the clustering, it's the number of closed triangles over all possible triangles. So for example, if I say that, um, you know, the friend and my friend is also my friend, it's a closed triangle. If I say the friend and my friend is not also my friend, that's an open triangle, right? It's just the number of closed over all possible triangles, closed, closed, open. That would be the clustering of each node and the average over them. And then finally, the disparity is pretty straightforward. Again, you see in these calculations, right? You know, it's just a sum over a little matrix. It's actually a pretty small matrix. It's only it's all the n by n for n qubits. And that, that's quite nice, or sorry, L by L, I guess, implementation here for L qubits. And that's quite nice because, like, any algebra can do these calculations. So very accessible. Okay, so as in, just as a case to explain those words. Sorry. I'm going to start with the quantum easy model. And so the quantum easy model, uh, for those of you who may not have seen it, just to clarify, you know, it's quadratic plus the linear model, right? So if you want to do many body anything, you know, linear units get <laughs> one operator doesn't do anything. So you need linear plus quadratic. So it's the most basic many body model you can have. And these are spin operators, and even more, you know, these are these are ZZ operators and this is X. So these two operators will um, if they dominate, okay, that's the sweet field of them, then only get a GHC spin. You know, it's all spin up plus all spin down, all zeros plus all ones, right? And have a number prize last year, that kind of state. And then at the critical point, you develop some kind of longer range correlations in the problem. And then finally, in the strong field limit where this term dominates, then all the spins go sideways. So Z respectively you should be given. Okay, now you think that's an old problem, it's easily solvable when you've been sitting in all kinds of elementary textbooks. But um, <clears throat> here's a paper I wrote in 2019, which is still very much under debate. And this is just about the open quantum system problem uh, for the for that easy quantum easy model. So it turns out, you know, even when you have 10 qubits, you already start to get quantum advantage in this problem. So you don't need you know 40 or 50. And that's because of the different scaling that happens when you do the open quantum system problem, just goes to show these simple problems sometimes they have very rich possibilities, you know. What we're going to do is we're going to just still have these nearest neighbor interactions, but ask ourselves what happens to the mutual information of the state that's the ground state of the Hamilton. We're just going to ask that very simple question. And, yes. So you have the Kraken system here because if you get the Kraken system, you need to do the redemption of the upper and down. Okay, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to be working on finite systems. Um, I'm not intending to do anything with our dynamic. We'll make some suggestions about the thing that we want to do, or say, or tell me that. But it's, this is the easy model, it's pretty elementary. It's intended just to be a demonstration of statements. So, yeah, I'm going to do sensor network simulations on the five and sites, so they're pretty big. Um, if I wanted to go all over that, I usually sort of will listen to what you I understand your point. It's a good one. Thank you. Any more questions? That's a good sign. I love getting questions during my talks. Okay. So, all right. So, what happens when you? Actually, go measure this. So here is the uh, density, clustering, and the disparity. I used Y because I ran out of D's, so very, very easy for density. And then this is a Pearson's correlation, just the reference to. And you can see that there is this interesting behavior uh, around one, which is where this critical point happens. So again, you know, the density is telling you about sort of everything eats everything, the clustering is telling you about the social network communities, and the disparity is telling you that there's a dominant one. And what you see is that all of these measures undergo some kind of extreme. Uh, change in behavior, maybe a point of reflection, maybe the minimum depends on the measure, uh, <clears throat> near the phase transition, and then these various lines are different system sizes. Okay, so now I'm going to do this thing that um, I tell my students they're going to do, just to show a nightmare plot with everything I do, you know, on the same plot. And why am I doing this? This is really for the experts in the audience, so, you know, those of you that are used to this, just ask, those of you that are used to the theory of quantum phase transitions, you know, that there are many different measures to identify a quantum phase transition, uh, you see, I'm going from 100 to 500 sites and using what we call tensor network methods. And you know, here's a correlation length, here's a volume entropy, here's negativity. There's like a lot of different, a lot of different typical measures. And then people look for, um, you know, some kind of external behavior, perhaps in a first derivative or a second derivative. Um, okay, 
So what I want to notice is the clustering, this red dash one is the one that comes you know, really very, very fast. Also, this um, disparity, the density minus disparity. They both go to the critical point very fast. That's a typical feature when using this tool for complex networks and then that with different um, uh, many by entities. So it turns out that um, it gets you to the critical point much faster. And it would not matter if we were only interested in putting that limit, but if we're interested in this computing where every qubit is, gets more expensive, right? Where we have maybe 50 or 100 qubits or recently 400, but not well, so well controlled, not great fidelity, you know, the less qubits you need to get the critical point. And I'm going to say something that I, I won't show you because it gets very complicated. This might be again for the experts in the audience, but this kind of base, which you call the BKT transition, which is a crossover problem. And famously, if you want to find where that occurs for what's called the Bose network Hamiltonian, just a slight generalization of this concept, uh, you need to be thousands of sticks. It's very higher information based. It's a problem. I, I can do it with this, this method in 50 or 100 with the same accuracy. So it's a factor of 10, 20 better. Uh, convergence to a critical point. And I think that's an important point showing it not only does no harm, but it's actually a useful point of analysis. So finally, excuse me, I did actually do a, a thermodynamic limit uh, solution of this. Sort of thing there. Um, you know, turns out that sort of after doing that first work, I, I realized actually with the pseudoc that uh, we could calculate this exactly, at least for easy models. So we did that. And, um, you know, here is uh, temperature on this axis, and then here's the control for the phase transition. Zero temperature, temperature based transition happening so right here around one. And then and then this is my temperature in units of that couple of two steps. And so what you see is, you know, whether you're talking about density, disparity, clustering, or any other typical measures, but it goes really so far only give you three, but typically in complex networks, you have like 20 or so that you're interested in. Here's betweenness, uh, which you have a diameter. Those are, those are very typical measures you use in this field. And you see that there is always some kind of behavior. And then each of these measures teases out some other part that's going on in the quantum group. So I quite like them because they can give you different views on what's happening in the quantum critical fan. The quantum critical fan is like, you know, there's a singularity in quantum phase position, but it's only really at zero temperature, but it's affects and they up in the finite temperature domain. So what we're doing is understand different features as you go through. And in fact, at the end for Bose Hubbard, I'll show you here, uh, you do actually find two significant features, one of them turns out called the entanglement transition. Okay. So now I told you that quantum quantum mutual information is actually measuring something, it's measuring two point correlators. <laughs> if I ask myself, for example, about the XX, YY, and ZT correlators for the density or the disparity, you know, you'll see that they all do something around the critical point, but they capture different features. So again, the advantage of the quantum mutual information is it gets all of these at once, right? Because it's balanced. Right? And it makes no assumptions on the operator's measure. Now, why would you care about that? Well, you know, for easy model, you only have six possible sectors, X, 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 Y, X, Z, Y, 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 Z, and Z, Z. That's it. But I also work in ultra molecules, which don't only have dimension two, but have dimension 144, for example. And then I have a more or less module 100, module of something, 144 squared sectors. It's an absurd number. Of it's a possible situation. What are they looking for? Which phase condition? So when I work on what's called molecular hybrid, I'm telling you this, this measure comes in very handy because now I have visual dimension. Capture all the correlators at once, and then I can go looking for the specific physical signal that I'm measuring the experiment. Okay. Right, so, to summarize the first, so sorry, introductory part of this talk, I've identified the uh, quantum complexity as something that is quantitative. I've given it the number, right? The number is determined by mutual information complex network. You can also use sector of any entry that's fine for the experts in the audience. That, that is something that's more easily measurable in experiments that work just fine. But only like this, this one women entry bounds the two point globe. So that's why I prefer it. Uh, I've told you that um, you know, quantum critical points present the most complex around state, maybe not surprise, critical things are very complex and interesting. And for this you know, it looks like clustering is the most effective measure. It's the same or better than all of them methods for the problems that we tried. Um, we found new structure in the quantum critical band. It's about a factor of 10 better for our quantum critical points that I mentioned. Here's a couple of papers on this, and I'm going to go ahead and move on. Um, yeah, people have picked up this tool and used it in a lot of different problems, a lot of reputability and other things. So maybe you can play with it, but it's a very easy tool to use. Okay, now I personally think, yeah, we, you know, it's a fine tool for ground states and statics, but it's a much better tool for dynamics, and that's what I want to show you. It's actually quite remarkable. Okay, so to, to get into dynamics, I'm going to have to really talk about what complexity is. Right. So now, in the same sense, yes. Do you want to ask about this? Yeah. 
Can you understand why this uh, binary cells uh, the approach to the criticality is so fast in the nature? I don't know. It's a, it's a numerical result, and I wish I had a better handle on it. I would love to. I kind of put it down because I decided to move on to dynamics where, you know, it's an absolutely necessary result. I said they couldn't accept it, so that would, but that is a great question. Yeah, any further questions? Yes. So you have calculated all these things for the Ising model? Ising model, no separate model. I did it for me, I didn't publish it. I mean, at some point, you just threw all the models and it gets boring. Uh, and then I have people who, you know, are citing this paper. Some might know, some I don't. You've done a lot of different models of including for me, I've done other things. They try to do density matrix or single bar density matrix sometimes, but then they then they trust it to reals. So you lose a lot of information. So I hope now that I solved the complex value complex number problem, then go back and you know, do the whole density matrix. That's a two to the n by two to the n problems, much bigger. I'm just doing it by n. So, you know, I'm not going to say I nailed this whole problem completely. I'm just showing you that it's a useful tool. It doesn't do harm to the statics. I think I understand something of what it's doing. Um, you know, like why would it be useful for a phase transition? Because phase transitioning, you're going to have uh, areas that are, are um, blocking the phase, right? And so and then these areas will appear in different parts of the system. You know, you think about the easy model, you know, punch and risk. So uh, you can imagine that if we're seeing you know, a lot of widespread varying structure. Uh, with correlations that are distributed in that way, that's something like typical phase. So that's essentially why it works. Well, why it works faster than that? that I mean. More questions? So let's go to part two of this talk. What is complexity? All right. So for the map, maybe we to see all the stuff that we had to skip before. <laughs> so. All right. So uh, just like chaos is not noisy, right? Um, complexity is not complicated, right? So we have a very precise notion of chaos. Actually, commonly in society, we use chaos to mean noise. It's actually basically means stochastic often. But it doesn't mean actually chaos means hit means hidden order, right? Um, and it means you get to explore a system dynamically, but you lose your instruction. Those very specific things that specific things. So complexity also means something, not just that it's a hard, but actually can be quite an easy problem. So you get nothing else from this talk if you ever get to the physical complexity is not complicated. Two separate ideas. Now, commonly when people talk about complexity in physics, they discuss algorithmic complexity or common ground complexity. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna illustrate that with the, the idea of what is the complexity of a number. So for example, if I look at pi, right? I don't know if you can see it, but uh, if you look at pi, there's many digits, right? And pi, and it seems that you know it's a sequence of digits that goes on forever. And uh, you know, you know the digits to talk about pi, and there are people who just memorize these digits for pi and make five hundred digits in their head, right? So, uh, so now actually that's not really true. Actually, you can represent pi, and, and, you know, just with this original product series, the very first product series with down stars. I know the exit series, and you see that this is a this is a conversion algorithm to pi. But there are much better ones now, and the code that you use to make pi is actually very short. So in that sense. If there's a generating code for that number that's short, we would say it's a low algorithm complexity because the code is the output, right? So I'm going to emphasize that this concept of computational complexity, whether it's P versus NP or generating pi or mu such idea, this is about computability or efficiency, right? It's not about physical complexity, but it's just something else. Physical complexity may or may not have you know high or low efficiency, it's probably intermediate. Uh, but this concept does not predict or capture physical complexity. I think that's a well established result in the literature. Okay. You know, so it is complexity. Well, I'm going to give you my personal list. I run this list past a lot of the top complexity scientists in the world, and they think it's not a crazy list. Sometimes they just say a little bit, but it's a decent list. Okay, yeah, but it's my first list. So we're going to identify 10 axes or aspects of physical complexity. The first is a non trivial environment, and I'm going to put that in the category of non normal. The second is multi scale hierarchies, as we see it in the brain. We need scales all the way from, you know, Size of a water molecule to the length of an axon in your back, right? All of those things matter in the brain. Uh, persistent dynamical macrostates and emergent phenomena that lead to life and symmetry breaking. And I think that's something that's going to inspire this. We have to understand that there's much more complexity. The thing that statistical gives us all to understand is that non Gaussian statistics, including these fat tail distributions, the so called not so rare, rare events, are a very typical feature we see in complex systems. The fifth one will be fractional geometries, such as the genome, the lungs, the stomach, the brain. They, they, they all have these kind of fractional geometries in them. 
um, astronomically large structure probability spaces that would be Jackson PT, right? And that's why it's effective, because it gets into such a space and effectively understands the structure, optimizes on that structure. Uh, multiple constraints and trade offs to your control theories, you would say that this is complexity. So, for example, volume versus the surface area in the brain, that's why our brain you know, is, a, is a folded sheet that's actually quite big, um, or robustness versus fragility. That is a very common kind of explanation for complexity. Um, diversity is very key. By the way, second order of entropy uh, is a diversity uh, measure in economics, commonly. Uh, let's address ecology of electrons. For electrons, you can get two species, right? Spin up and spin down. And for ecology of hundreds of species in your vacuum, for example, on the house. Okay, so those are problems we could trace business, but we often don't. Um, selection principles, including natural selection, that is everything from, you know, like a potential natural selection, like uh, uh, we think of, you know, Darwinian evolution, but also learning and memory in the immune system. You know, there's a lot of different ways that kind of thing appears. Uh, and if you're a biologist, you would say this is complexity. And then finally, connectivity. Those are the complex numbers we're discussing today. Um, and my driving question is, you know, what is the origin theory of biological and classical complexity? Does it occur on a quantum level? And so I've actually been driving this for about uh, 10 or 12 years now in my research, and I think I've shown in almost all these axes at this point that you know a very clear same mathematics converging quantum systems, which means that yes, any new theory of complexity or any explanation of complexity must include quantum systems if it is isn't. So today's talk is on complex networks, uh, specifically on mutual information. Um, and let's try to define complexity in a simple way. That was a really big list and very comprehensive. Let's come back to something very simple. We're looking for the origins of physical complexity, maybe emergence and trade offs. This is a fundamental science perspective. Physical complexity is not really complexity or complicated. We may define it as follows complexity characterizes a system of multiple individuals which may interact in many ways, resulting in collective views. That's one definition of complexity. For example, Humans with friendships give rise to social network, as I discussed earlier. You know, neurons through synaptic firing give rise to consciousness, is the idea. Uh, you know, transistors through conductive wires give rise to a CPU, et cetera. So, you know, in good physics tradition, we're going to create a spherical cal version <laughs> of all of those complicated things. And that's going to be Goldilocks quantum serotonin. And actually, I actually don't know if the Goldilocks story is common in here. So, we have this story. People know this, read this and don't. Goldilocks story is about a little girl who comes into a house and uh, she's kind of a squatter. So she comes in, she uh, she tries out different chairs. One's too big, one's too small. She finds the one that's just right. She tries out different porridge, too hot, too cold, mine's just right. She goes and she tries the bed, she falls asleep, and then she's woken up with the bears who actually live in the house. Okay, so this is the story. It's an interesting story, but it's a story about trade offs and balance. Right? Um, so uh, so we call these Goldilocks rules after Goldilocks. Lots of people here. And it's a pretty simple idea. Um, it, it is just a nearest neighbor where you look uh, right, but you also look left. Okay, so this bit will flip or not flip according to the state of its two neighbors. It's called the neighborhood. So the 1D bit string is the individuals. Uh, the local transition function is the interactions. That's this function that does the split. And then through a simultaneous global update, it gives rise to group behaviors. And I'll show you those in just a minute. They're pretty fast. These are called elementary serotonin. They're the most simple idea. There are 256 of them. Why 256? You have three bits. Each of them can be a zero or a one. So that's two key, that's eight. And then the middle bit can flip or not flip depending on those eight states. So it's two to the eight, which is 256. Now I'm going to show you one of the rules. I'll show you rule 30. So in rule 30, you can see it's just written in binary here, right? So you know, you've got zero, because that, that bit uh, did not flip. That bit did flip. So this is a one. You see how this is going to work. And then if you look at this, this is what? 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus 16. That's the So that's 30. Okay. So that's just 30 in line. And now you see how to write out the rules. Um, okay. So, you know, this idea has been around for a while. People played with them. And uh, it turns out there are four main categories. If you're interested in learning complexity, by the way, my student from it's ICER or ICER, it's an ICER. Okay. Sorry, it's basically easy. So my student from my book had to actually tell himself how to spoke before he came to work with me. It's a really great book called Think Complexity by Downey. It's freely available online. I'm not advertising my own book. This is something else's work. It's very nice. It's lots of coding exercises to learn complexity. So rule 56, I'm going to flip a bit, and then time runs up this way, or the circuit layer, right? And then um, the bit index runs this way, and that's for like space. So you see that this is order. It's just dimension one, that little set. 
No, you look like that. Other rules look like random numbers. There's rule 30 that I told you about. If you run uh, an integer uh, random number generator in Mathematica, you were actually using rule 30. It's actually what it uses. Okay. Um, rule 90 gives you a fractal and there's the five dimension in the calculator, one point five nine. And so you know you've got three kinds of categories that are very common: order, randomness, and fractals. Fractals are usually under the chaos on the strange and strange tractors. So, you know, uh, I think that that, you know, that, that all was maybe not so surprising, but it is surprising is that one of these rules is turning. So that was originally to this complexity in this problem. And that idea that, you know, simple rules might be in the computation, that idea spread through physics, that maybe the laws of physics could uh, come out of simulations like these. I mean, the universe was using these kind of simulations. That turns out not to be true. And a lot of people work on this for a lot of years. It's not true because you need a special grid. So we're running this for one one D, but if you run it in two D, if you use a square grid, you actually not get food dynamics. You need a, you need a honeycomb lattice. Right? Well, you know, why do you need a honeycomb lattice? Well, it's crystallography, right? And you know, long wavelength, the lattice structure will affect your long wavelength. It's, it's easy to understand why you would need that. And so the idea that you need to put a special grid on the universe, people just didn't buy it. They said, okay, this is a simulation of it. So it became kind of a toy. So now in that same spirit, people tried to come up with something like a quantum cider or something. And they wanted to know, okay, maybe you can't get the classical universe, maybe you get the quantum universe out of this. Well, guess what? You know, if you can replace bits with qubits, right? You can replace your three qubit transition function, it's called a TOFL decay. So it's a CCU or CCB here. I have two controls and then I have a local unit here. Um, and then I can get some emergent behavior, but classical bits, you know, I flip this bit and this bit doesn't know about it. The quantum bits, I flip this bit, and if they're entangled, that bit definitely knows. Right? You know that because the bell is in the quantum bits. Yeah. So in fact, you need a special time ordering or circuit order in this problem. So it's even worse than the classical problem. So again, people said, well, quantum serotonica, they don't give you Dirac equation unless you do a special time ordering and a special spatial ordering. Uh, you know, this whole thing is just actually a bad simulation of how it is. So what I quite like about this work is I've shown that um, the complexity outcome of these kinds of rules is actually quite remarkable. It's the key to all kinds of quantum anybody. So because of this, I think quantum serotonin has been revived. Quantum serotonin also provides some very nice bounds and, and arguments about classical simulability. And there's nice work by Hastings on this that I can recommend to you. That's on an computation side. So, but on the physical complexity side, it turns out the physical complexity does not care about the ordering in the circuit. It actually doesn't care about the local unit theory. It only cares about the transition function. All right, so now I'm going to show you 16 rules. It's going to be pretty much pictures for the rest of this talk. Okay, these 16 rules uh, are the reversible cellular automata. The other 240 rules are irreversible. That means they require open quantum system dynamics. And to, to be honest, no one knows how to write those down yet. So for all the students in the room, here's an open problem for some of you to solve. I'd be happy to chat about it with you. I will also be here on Monday. What is my office again? Zero E012, right? E012, please come and talk with me if you would like to talk about a good problem. It's a very solid problem out there, and it's a lot of smart people have worked on it, but it's, it's really a problem about having a vision for what these rules should do. It's not really a hard math problem. It's actually a conceptual problem people are struggling with. So I'm going to work with just the 16 reversible rules. I'm going to number them 0 to 15. And, you know, they're again numbered in time or in some simple way, right? And, you know, you don't have to look at the math here, but, you know, here's the local unitary. Here's, you know, how I have everything in the CMN. And here's the projectors to left and right to do the two controls. What does reversible look mean? Reversible means I run it forward and backward in time. Uh, if I run it backward in time, I come back to the same state. Yeah. Now, okay, 16 number rules turn out to be trivially irreversible in elementary cellular time, like not so much in the quantum side, but because even if you know one bit, you're done. Okay. So, it really, but it's still mostly a reversible problem. And actually, all the interesting rules in the classical problem are here. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to do the boring rules for quantum mechanics. They're actually very exciting. OK, so if I run T0, you know, like literally nothing happens. I just always have the unit. You tear out every one. If I run T15 for every possible combination on right and left, you know, it, it's always on. So these are, these are trivial cases. Um, if I run T13, I have high activity plus broken symmetry. I'll show you a picture that's very far from Goldilocks. T1 is what's known as the uh, PXP model, which I'm not very discrete time. It's what you get in good paper atoms together, like in experiments in Michigan with Harvard, in Monica Schleiser-Smith at Stanford. It's actually sort of the default thing you get. And it says that, you know, I'll do an X flip, but only if I have zero, zero left and right. Okay, so it's called reverse blockade. 
So, so I think, uh, you know, this rule is sort of too cold, you know, so even though it's near Goldilocks. Um, T14 is just, the, it's just the opposite of this rule and it has a similar property. Uh, but T6, that is a rule of spin symmetry, and that is the Goldilocks rule. So I'll show you. And T6 says, if I have 0, 1, or 1, 0, right, then I do my little things, right? not other ones. So that's a kind of trade-off or balance condition, and that's why I call it Goldilocks, and I'm going to show you what happens, and now I'm just going to show you some simulations. These are exact randomization simulations. Of course, they have much bigger simulations, but you know, the pedagogy here, 19 cubits is fine. I like to show this because when it writes my group who reproduce the simulation, no problem within a few weeks of trying to write a code from scratch. So, you know, it's very straightforward. Uh, here is space. This is the index of the qubit number, and here's the circuit layer, which we'll call time. This is discrete time, and this is very late times, up to 10,000. You can see for the Goldilocks rule, activity in the average spin continues all the way to the top of the screen. You know, for this T1, <laughs> there's a little bit of activity at late times, but it's near equilibration. These are certainly equilibrating at late times. You can also see this in the entry, and this is just a local entry is determined by measuring only one site at a time. And you see again that there's all kinds of activity going on in this Goldilocks rule. There is still some remaining activity in T1, by the way. This is related to many body scars. It's interesting, but we get to talk again on Monday. And then you see for T14 and 13, it's just totally maximum entry, right? So it's gone to a random state of late times. Okay. Now, is that enough to understand this problem? I already know. I was not able to solve the mathematics of this problem with just these measures I needed on regional condition. So these are the measures that we had before. I did this work. And now we have a new set of measures. And those measures are this two point measure, right? So again, this regional condition is the entropy of J, it's the entropy of K minus the joint entropy of J and K. Yeah, this comes from this is derived from a two by two that from a two by two that from a four by four matrix. Yes. To put it for starting, uh, so you are starting with this G2 state, and when meaning you start with a different initial state, you will not get such stuff. Right. So, uh, for the purposes of pedagogy, I'm just showing some extremely simple initial states. These are the ones that you would get it, you know, put on uh, your favorite uh, search engine. Um, what is elementary cyber topic? Your Wikipedia page, but of course, we look at many initial conditions. In fact, I look at the candidate paradigm and get many other things. So, um, there's actually 100,000 simulations that I did, but I, I'm just good at making it simple for him. But yes, you're correct. So, D6 really also depends on the What's the question? D6 for also it will depend on the initial state. So, so, so the answer, like in all statistical physics or almost all statistical physics, is that we're looking for typical outcomes, not the atypical outcomes. I can always find initial state, we'll do something weird. Like our mind in the logistic map, even in the window where you have chaos, you can find period two, period three, period four, whatever you want with a very special starting initial condition. However, you know, the point is that you can find all the periods, right? And that's what makes it chaotic, but you don't always get chaos. So you can always find initial condition for which, you know, strange things happen. But as far as we can tell, the set of initial conditions to get rise to things like this is dense. That's not no, no, the reason I'm asking for the star case, you need atypical initials, right? Sort of. I mean, at least the standard star, I know you need this uh, J2 or J2, some state like that. So for D6 also, you are saying there has to be some star like this. No, there, yeah, it's actually not. I didn't publish this yet at all for D6, but there are some states that are very interesting uh, that may play a significant role. But I don't believe that statics, you know, analysis of the eigenstates is sufficient to understand this problem. If analysis of the eigenstates was sufficient, I wouldn't need complex analysis. I was going to use an additional tool. So, um, None of my colleagues working on this or thinking about this for uh, seven years were able to find what we recently found in the hall without even thinking about this complex stuff. So certainly it's been useful. Uh, but yeah, uh, one can go back and carefully think about the IU system. That's exactly what your team is doing, actually, is doing that. So I'm happy to do it. But I don't have results to present to you today. I do know some things about it, but they're quite unpublished, so I probably shouldn't. Uh, you have around five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, that's fine. Show just a couple slides and put a few conclusions. So here's the uh, GAC state. I'll let this all in. Sort this all in. And you see how it's very even right? the notes and the links. Um, if I look at a Goldilocks rule, you know what happens is um, it starts to develop these communities. This, this is a time slice. These communities will rearrange themselves. But does everybody see these three dominant communities? Yeah, so it's high clustering, right? Here's T1. You see there is some kind of back one, there's smaller rearrangement, you know, saying T14, but not such community formation. And here's this T13, which is basically like a random state. Now, this, this is the typical kind of picture there because of population understanding of social systems. You know, 
Of course, in the physics unit, we're going to want to look at not these simple time slices, but cumulative plots. So if I look at the probability density of the node strength, right, versus the node strength, what do I call the density? You know, you'll notice that this Goldilocks rule really stands out. You have this big tail. Those are highly connected hubs. That's a typical feature of a small world. Right. Um, if you uh, if you plot the clustering as a function of time, you know, you'll find out that only the Goldilocks rule stays very high. Notice this is going from 10 to minus 1, 10 to minus 5. <laughs> if I do find size scaling, and see that the clustering remains high on the vertical. I'm not going to see these are formal results. These are numerical indications that they're using. Uh, and then finally, the rearrangements in the back one are, are larger uh, for the global rules compared to other ones. Now, in this case, I am showing you a particular distribution. This is many different distributions. That's a summary plot. I can't put this all on the same plot. These features are quite typical uh, for lots of different simulations. Okay. So the last thing I want to do before I close, is I want to show you, you know, what happens when you have a nice idea like this. You know, you go to the next brand new simulation. Now, first you have to come up with the quantum circuit, and the quantum circuit, you know, uh, this this is just on this is five qubits, right? Here's all the layers <laughs> in the circuit, and they go into one QCA cycle, and then you sort of find the best path in the chip where you have the best fidelity, right? You initialize it, you run your QC, QCA cycles, and you measure. The QCI, QCA cycle, I'm going to do a, a Hadamard, well, in this area, which is like take my quantum um, bit and rotate it if it's north, zero, I rotate it down to the equator, and then I'll do that with control, okay, zero, one, zero, one, zero, and then I have to do that on an audio inside the network pattern. So, you know, there's many layers in the each step. Okay, and here's what happens when you actually, this is real data, it's on the theory, here's what happens when you actually run it. So, this, this middle one is what I first saw. It's just, it's just blobs. You know, and that's supposed to be a high fidelity simulation. This is this is my emulation of what I should have seen, okay, with the actual noise specs that Google gave me, assuming random depolarization noise, and these don't look alike at all. So real quantum computers are much worse than they look like on your spec sheets. The way that I get to the answer is um, I have about six different corrections and took about a year working with the Google team. This is post-selection here, and you see this actually looks like real experimental data for these very most that will look like that, but at least it looks much closer to this. Here I can pull out my clustering measures and look at things. I'll tell you the end result. It's sufficient. Uh, by the way, what am I most selecting on? This uh, model conserves the number of domain walls, the number of places where zero and one meet next to each other. So that number is conserved. So if I just throw out any results that have a different number of domain walls, that's post selection. It's a simple rule. Okay. So now, when you post select on a random state, you get some word problem, right? So that means my clustering is going to go up. So this black dashed line is what happens when I post-select on my random state. Here's what happens when I don't post-select. Here's what happens when I do post-select on my simulation. That's my prediction. <laughs> Here's what actually happens. So importantly, this clustering goes up and comes back down at around 12 QCA cycles for different numbers of qubits, 15, 17, and 19. You'll notice it always comes down at the same time, the back one. That means my result is not dependent on quantum volume. It is dependent only on the number of circuit layers. I could have 100,000 qubits and it's still at the same time. Very important because on every spec sheet for a quantum computer you can buy out there, they're going to tell you about the quantum volume. It's based on T1 and T2 times, single qubit measure, right? Uh, maybe it's based on two qubit fidelity. It's not based on many line states. If you're doing a mini biasing, you may get a different result. All right. So, with that, given time, um, I, I would sort of live start with this quantum volume on piece, but uh, Actually, have us one minute, or four, should I not just drop it? Okay, so why are we doing better than a quantum volume model's coherence in contrast to all spec sheets in the quantum computing as well? So, I have upcoming kind of proof of integrability in Goldilocks and QCA uh, based on six vertex models that very like large class of problems. Now, I, I can show this for three, not, not five site simulations, um, and it means that I can do uh, quantum cam tuning with. Sets. So I think that's a very kind of powerful result. I can have an integral and non-integral. These are these are three fermions, and it means that they're classically simulatable. And that could be one explanation of why you know, why you know, it's actually this is a classically simulatable problem. Another reason is there are many conserved charges, like right, predictable problems. So we can obtain 13 conserved charges on five contiguous sites. This allows us to predict the dynamics of correlators for large systems, you know, to relate the free fermion you know, back to what you actually measure with the correlator. There are many surprising dynamical outcomes, and, and if you want to see methods like this, you can look at the recent Google IBM measurements to determine the conservation of this. 
organization. And then finally, uh, I'm going to pose this open question. What is the space between classically or near classically simulatable models like these and boring random states? So we know random states require the quantum volume. Yeah, we know these kinds of models don't. I think it's a question about macroscopic uh, versus uh, mesoscopic versus microscopic notions of decoherence. You know, microscopic would be like fidelity. Macroscopic might be something like thermalization and equilibration time. So complex networks provide new tools to explore this regime. I hope that you found that interesting and compelling. Uh, with that, I will skip this extra thing I was going to say about Linnaeus's work. I'll just summarize. Um, I've told you about mutual information and complex networks. That it quantifies physical quantum complexity. I told you about how you can use the quantum phase conditions and untangle quantum cellular autonomy. I told you about Goldilocks quantum cellular autonomy which demonstrate physical complexity already occurs in the quantum world. It creates a new, highly structured, highly entangled state. Uh, coming soon, I have this result in the building on CAM theory, and it uh, provides a new benchmarking tool on computing. Um, an, an important piece of this benchmarking is that physical and computational complexity considerations coexist in this model. Very different ideas, but this model we can do both of them at the same time. Okay. I had time, I would have told you about imprinted versus emerging networks. These are emerging ones, right? But I told you I could have imprinted them, like actually in the quantum device. Now, it's interesting that imprinted complexity does not necessarily create complexity and or less state. That is the work that I did with the potential. As a matter of fact, I uh, also have a work on a new tool for continuous variable systems and quantum communication systems. That's the um, freestand optical network I mentioned. And then very recently, I have a paper where I go to hypergraphs. Those are, those are three index objects. Okay, I, saw, I started solving some uh, generalized satisfiability problems in my show, so which will speed up in QAOA on these hypergraphs. So uh, maybe that would be a more technical talk for another time, but you might want to have a look at that. It's a pretty radical thing. Um, the computer scientists are freaking out. This is sort of like, yeah, of course, quantum computers are awesome. Really cool. So, all right, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Being What is the idea about this? So you were basically uh, thinking that complex network like quantum state mapping to a quantum state, and then you are using the uh, quantum uh, mutual information to characterize that uh, network or something. Okay, so in general, <laughs> when I want to understand a quantum state, the very typical thing you would learn is that quantum mechanics is like taking an average. Uh, and then the next thing you would do, you know, take an average or some observable. Next thing you do is you take the variance of that average, and that gets you the uncertainty equation. So those are moments. So moments analysis is one way to understand quantum states. A second way to understand quantum states is correlations, and that's really complementary to moments analysis. Right? And correlations say if something happens over here, is that connected to this thing happening? Right? Correlations are classical in quantum, and quantum mechanics has more correlations than classical systems. That is the essential feature in time. So mutual information is a way of capturing all those correlations at once. I could just I could have just used a two-point correlator. It's just that I prefer something that captures all of them. So you can think of this as correlation. This is very specific. Um, now that comes out of the quantum state itself, right? The, the, the nice thing is mutual information, there's no operator in the quantum. It's literally just about the state. When you do correlations, you have an actual operator You're saying, oh, if I measure Z and I measure Z, what's the correlator? It's just I measure. Why and I measure Z with the correlates with different answers. You know, because I'm thinking about physical measure, mutual information saying, well, in general, what kind of correlations might be present in the state that I can in principle measure? That's the idea. And then complex network theory is to analyze a two-point object, you know, a two-rank tensor without collapsing it down to a vector or a scale. So I have this tensor, and you know, it, it really is like you, know, you look at a picture and you ask what's what's the information content of the picture. I won't get that just from I by either scene. So, you know, I need other tools to finish. That's it. That's all. Yeah, so, so, uh, so the, uh, maybe you told what I thought is uh, so to get this uh, last thing, simulation, matching with this. So, you had to do some post selection so that I didn't understand. Oh, sure. Yeah, I, I, I just say things, not only post selection. So, it's a supplement of our nature, uh, nature paper. That's all. You know, see some of these nature journals. You can find them on the website. So, okay, so the supplemental material, we go through the supplemental detail. And the reality is, in the quantum computation right now, you have to do a lot of that stuff. For example, um, every rotation that you do for Google's machine at that time was pi over 24 abstract. So we have to count for the pi over 24 error. But many, 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 many things. 
So, okay, so post selection is the one that's sort of the most one of the strongest effect, and I think it's really interesting to think about. So when I teach um, uh, when I teach uh, and quadratic potential, I'm sure you also thought about your talk. Guys, that's the quadratic problem, and I start putting the quartic one, so eventually it bends up and it has some symmetry breaking it. So a typical um, way that you would you know, teach that problem is to you know, have the quartic piece upside down and the quadratic in the middle, see how potential it does this. Okay, so now you have a ball that's rolling in the middle of this potential. And uh, if I run a simulation method and I don't conserve energy explicitly as an auxiliary condition, my ball will eventually come out of this, sorry, of this potential, right? Uh, in order to make that simulation physical, I have to put in the constraint that I'm trying to simulate. Uh, in the continuous theory, we need it because I've discretized, right? Uh, I, I, I actually have to put that in. Yeah. Um, so when I teach simulations, that's what I do. This is no different. I'm putting in constraints that come from the actual model itself. And that means that any, it's kind of from error mitigation. So any errors that don't satisfy the constraint, I throw that problem out. And that constraint happens to be number of domain balls. It's actually conserved by many different models. You can even do hard random series and it's still conserved. It's actually very hard to get away from. And domain walls is like, you know, I have all zeros and all ones, and there's kind of a wall between them. So that number of walls is conserved. So the single bit flip, that would be two such walls. Those are not fermions, by the way, for the free fermion map. That's actually why. So but you know, so it's more complicated than just two fermions. But the to do this uh, computer, it is, you were saying that that domain wall number is conserved. That what? In the, but you had an experiment, right? So, right. Yeah, it is conserved by certain. It's not conserved in binding appearance because you can have correlated errors. Right. Somehow, to, so that's what I'm sort of confused because to match that experiment, you have to keep the constraint in the simulation. Right. So, what you do is you look at the number of domain balls in every outcome of every simulation, and any ones that's different, say from two, I would literally throw out that data. That means I can only get to about, excuse me, maybe 23 qubits. And then I'm keeping one in 100,000 runs. Okay, so there's no way for post selection to be scalable. The only solution is either error correction or you get better fidelity, then the errors will look fair, and then you get better scale. But post selection will always kill you. Now, Psyquantum claims that they have solved the post selection problem, but they have this the solution and demonstrated it. So, yes. I mean, Terry Rudos is my guy. <laughs> Maybe they have solved it. They gave a lot of presentations where they claimed it. As far as I know, you lose an exponential fraction of your data. Right, every time you do post selection. This conservation law that you that is still do even in the open system yet, or is it? Well, I didn't publish those yet, but I'm I'm happy to show them to you. They do involve products of poly operators. Um, as I say, there are 13 of them. For the initial conditions I'm considering K and the matter. And from there I can use them to get the Gibson symbol, which I uh, really don't know is you know it's just like equilibration of the problem, like you have E to the minus theta H over Z, but instead of just theta and H, they have like different. It's not only data, different temperatures. Temperature associated with the confluent players, and then different kinds of operators or conserved charges associated with those. Not only that, so, so those all sit up in the exponential. So we show that, of course, we converge to that, and you know, this little demo. But if you very you can optimize, then still there will be approximately conserved. I did not. Um, so I, I did a lot of analysis of this problem under random depolarization modes, which is not a great place model, but it's something. I did that before I knew this uh, free for me. I'm also I have to come back and check that, you know. And I, I guess that was a can question, and that's an open one, just a can question, which is especially interesting. There are many in this matter physicists that are under uh, two false assumptions about can theory. I can tell you because I spent a lot of time in classical numerical systems. And one is uh, it, it's, it's only relevant for closed or Hamiltonian evolution closed systems, as house entry. And two is only relevant for finite systems, the finite size like the house entry. So both of them might easily show you examples of those cases. So if you have a you know a field theoretic system or like you like or an infinite system, you know, it's discrete and you have some but I'll just say how can your office be trying to be used in the I guess I'd say my crisis have a very large spectrum problem. And the result from that is that even though the graphs are sometimes you can cover with a much responsive very easily. So have then we become properly studied on this kind of experiment as well? Our particular example is part of one of the graphs. Yeah, I'm not really saying that. I think it's a, it's a strong subject for study. 
I mean, they, you know, the, the, the issue is, in my view, is the complex value piece. So now that we have the complex value measure, so it starts to generalize. Because a lot of the appropriate formulation of the graph is that, you know, there's going to be interference between the things. Right? So unless you have an interference written in, I'm sure if it's, it's a very minimal <laughs> representation. Um, so, I mean, this was something derived finally in uh, like October last year. Actually, three groups, all three of us are put out around the same time, and I think now there's going to be a very new subject. So, with those tools, you can go cap up that absolutely. And there are many, many graph theory um, problems that are accessible to quantum analysis. Yeah, and probably some quantum advantage in, in various places, I guess. That's a great question. Yeah. I'd call it a publicly expanded field at the um, conference on public systems, ACS, which is the major conference in the field. There was a, a satellite workshop on this uh, last year. So, yeah, it's kind of like that. So, it's wrong. And there's a question in my case that we still take. Yes. You can support this last point that you mentioned here. So, I mean, the bit of the explanation for freedom. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> that's a whole separate talk. So, maybe we should talk on Monday. But uh, what I'll say is that this is a hypergraph problem. Okay. And it's about, um, you know, uh, constraint satisfiability problems. Um, and uh, it, it's it's assigned network plus or minus signs, right? But only um, uh, zeros and ones. So, uh, so it's a much simpler problem than this one. And then you have to ask yourself, um, is there a way to get, uh, you know, exponential speed up in these constraint satisfied, satisfiability problems? And there is, it involves transforming the classical problem in a way that is totally useless to the classical problem. Transform, you need to try to find a minimum, right? And the minimums are sparse. Uh, so you get stuck in metastable states where you can find a minimum, you know, of the flow problem, it's a typical problem, these you know, kind of states. And so there's a, there's a transformation on the classical side that you make that has nothing to do with the classical problem, but then makes the quantum problem really good. And the reason is classically you're always coming down from the top, quantum mechanics are coming up in the bottom. So that, that, that's the trick to take advantage of. So this is worked out actually with five mind students in our quantum engineering program as part of the Fujitsu uh, supercomputing uh, competition. And we spent 200K in supercomputing hours to solve this and also um, exponential speed up of macroscopic quantum. There are quite a lot of results there. I would welcome you to have a look or discuss with you on Monday. Um, yeah, yeah, I think it's I think it's quite nice. I'd, I'd be happy if you can show it, you know, doesn't work. So far, none of us can. So we really think we have two actually two significant cases of exponential speed up. So who's we'll showing me negative view? Uh, we have actually quite quite a lot of theory backing it up. So you can have a look. I'm sorry, it's a really long paper. I have not thought yet about how to get like a colloquium on that. It's pretty technical. Uh, we've been getting those computer science talks, uh, like to continue to uh, Amazon Web Services, but uh, yeah, maybe there's a way to do it. I, I probably I understand it well enough myself, or I should be able to tell to, to kindergarten. I can't do that. So, we'll probably get it. Say it again. Is, is it related to? No, no, this is a publicity of the Oh, yes, yes, yes. It's on the other graph. Yeah, no, otherwise I wouldn't announce that. That's a very radical thing. So, um, the, the, the key is to do approximate QA instead of exact QA. Okay, that's part of the key. So in quantum mechanics, we're trying to do everything too exactly. That's a whole other discussion to have. Yeah. I think we should. Uh, I'll, I'll hang out in front and just come in and ask questions after. Great. Right. Okay. Exactly. Please be free. Let's anchor. Thank you.